Beyond the Wrench with Jay Ganinen from Wrenchway. Welcome back to another episode of Beyond the Wrench. On this week's episode of Beyond the Wrench, Jay is joined by Mary Kelly, who is an event leadership economist. Mary shares with us advice on asking for testimonials from customers, how to find quality employees, the importance of having a vision, and overall just some great tips on how shops can be more profitable with less work. This week's podcast sponsor is Lithia Motors. Lithia Motors is one of the largest automotive group retailers in the United States and is among the fastest growing companies in the Fortune 500. Lithia offers a truly exceptional variety of used cars for sale. Lithia's used cars are known for quality and you can find a safe used car and a reliable truck at Lithia dealers. Lithia has been a really great partner of ours for quite a while now and are truly are such a great company and you all should go check them out. Um, I hope you enjoy this week's episode and we'll see you next week. On this week's episode, I am incredibly happy to be joined by Mary Kelly. Uh, I actually heard Mary speak at a conference a couple of years ago and she absolutely blew me away in that conference. And so I am really excited to get to know her better and more and then hear some of her story and then uh, talk about how we uh, how we can make people more productive uh, with less work. So how are you doing today, Mary? Doing great. And I think it's so important, Jay, that people right now are able to be more productive, be more efficient, be more effective, because that, frankly, is where what our employees need from us. It's what our customers need from us. Yes. And businesses in general need this so terribly bad. So before we dive into that topic, let's talk about you a little bit. Uh, uh, what do you do? And uh, and then we'll, we'll kind of dive into the story of how you got there. I'm a leadership economist. And what that means is I get up every single morning and I look at about three hours of economic data so my leaders don't have to. I look at market trends, where things are going, I predict the future, and then I give my leaders the information they need in order to make really good decisions about what to do next. And I focus a lot on uh, linear thinkers, uh, finance people, bankers, credit unions, and manufacturing and people who fix things. And this is where your audience comes in. I like the idea that we're able to look forward, not just by next week or next month, but farther into the future so that people know what to do. And how do you do that? Three hours of looking at economic data would kill me. That would, uh, just, just one day of that. And to do it every day uh, is really, really impressive. So it's what I love to do. I um, So I think the Beatles were wrong. I don't think love makes the world go round. I think it's economics. And while I love love, everybody loves love, we've got to be able to look at the intrinsic motivations, which is what people do, what makes them best off. And that generally is in an economic situation. So I look at that and I get up every single morning. I turn on two or three different news channels. I read, I look at what's happening next. You know, a lot of people right now are looking at Russia and they're thinking, oh, this is because of this old nationalism. No, it's economic. Russia, for just for a fun example, Russia is the fourth largest consumer of energy in the world. Fourth largest. Wait a second, what? But they're less than 3% of the global GDP. They went into Ukraine because Ukraine has the resources they need. They've got the uranium and the plutonium and all the metals and, and uh, the nuclear stuff that Russia desperately needs, along with warm water ports. This has nothing to do with nationalism. It has everything to do with Russia trying to become a better economic power, for example. So once you know that, all of a sudden people's motivations become more clear, and then you can address things on that motivational level. Most of our employees, even the ones who say they love to come to work, wouldn't do it if we didn't pay them. So there's got to be some kind of reward system in place. And again, I look at a variety of different numbers every single day. I talk to other economists every single day, and we look at, we all look at kind of different things. So it helps me to get a broader base of what my people need. It's, it's such a cool thing. And your background is absolutely fascinating. I, I, it, I want you to talk about how your professional career has gone because it is incredibly unique. And I think when, when people start to understand your background, we'll kind of put the pieces together as to why this is such a, uh, such a passion uh, for you. 
I'm a former Naval Intelligence Officer. I spent 25 years on active duty in the Navy, mostly in Asia. I went to the Naval Academy, was very fortunate to graduate with um, about a thousand of my best friends and be in the military, the world's finest military. I've been taught by some of the best leaders on the planet. I was able to be in charge of people at a very early age, which meant I made a lot of mistakes early on. Nobody needs to make the same mistakes that I did. And then I got to be a professor at the Air Force Academy as a civilian, at the Naval Academy as a military professor. And then I've taught for other civilian universities such as Hawaii Pacific University. I taught in the Graduate School of Colorado State University and in the business Cox Business School at SMU. It's incredible. I mean, that that's you just rattled it off, but I mean, it, everything you touched on would be like a, a point of conversation. Uh, I think you could go to any cocktail party and about uh, Trump anybody in terms of what you'd be able to talk about. <laughs> You've got a lot of great experience. Well, I've been very fortunate, and I think a lot of it, and a lot of your audience members do the same thing. When there's an opportunity, you say yes. When it looks like, hey, that's going to be fun, that's going to be interesting, I can learn from that, or wow, that looks that looks different, you jump on in and you just say yes. It, it, one of those things is speaking. I picked your brain when we spoke before, and I I have to give you the the highest compliment in terms of how you presented and captivated a really, really large audience. Uh, I would have been probably terrified in that scenario, but you just absolutely killed it. And it felt like you were talking to everybody individually. I, I, I'll never forget just sitting in the audience and being like, oh my goodness, like this is super appealing, uh, super interesting information that probably wouldn't have been interesting to me. Otherwise you made it seem uh, really interesting and broke it down to a point to where I could understand it. I was just fascinated by hearing you speak. Jay, you're so kind to say that, and I appreciate it because I do work at that at that aspect. I do work really hard at it, and I do take that as a huge compliment. I think teaching school for a long time helps a lot because I'm not when I'm speaking, I'm not in my head. I have to be in my audience's head. And so when I research an audience ahead of time, I have to know, what they're thinking about even when they're not consciously thinking about it. So I put myself in my audience's shoes. I'm like, okay, what did I wake up about and think about? And what is my concern? And what did I put on the back burner? What should I be thinking about that I'm not thinking about because I don't want to think about it because it sounds really hard. That's the space I have to operate in to me in order to be as effective a speaker as possible. And as you know, I'm a frustrated comedian. I would, lo I would love to be on the comedy circuit, except um, that's way too late at night. And you know, by nine or 10 o'clock at night, I've probably already had a glass of wine or something. So <laughs> you know, that's the best idea. But Bourbon, wine. I'm not very picky. <laughs> Which makes you an extremely fun person. Uh, I, what I want everybody to do right now that's listening is uh, grab a pen and some paper because some of the stuff that we're going to talk about today is impactful stuff. This is stuff that's going to help you. And uh, I don't even think it's just our industry, but any industry. And that's maybe doing uh, more with less or being able to be uh, more productive because at the end of the day, that's what it's all about is, is producing an output. And I want to talk about maybe our audience is shops, right? So we're, we're working on either cars or trucks or, or machinery. Uh, I want to open the conversation by just asking, are there things that when you look at a business that you identify like immediately and you're like, okay, this has to change. This is, this is, you guys are running a, a, a very unorganized or very, uh, I guess unorganized, probably the best way to say it. But I, when, when you initially look at a business, how do you get an idea of maybe where they need improvement? So first I start from a very exterior place because I'm a customer. So I know what works. I look on your website, start there, look at your website. Is your information accurate? And you would think it would be, except it's not. Do you know how many websites I've caught where two digits of a phone number are mixed up or the address is mixed up or it doesn't show up on Google Maps or it doesn't show up as a Google business? That's number one, look at your website, make sure your information is accurate. Number two, look at your website and make sure the pictures of you and your staff are somewhere in the last decade. If you've still got your high school picture there and frankly, you've retired, it's not a good look. It just isn't. If you've got the really long sideburns and the bell bottoms, it's time to swap out the pictures. 
Number three, get some testimonials from your customers. I'm a buyer. I want to know that you've been able to take care of people like me. And by like me, it's people who have a car, have a truck, need it fixed. That's what I need help on. So I don't want a testimonial from your sister saying you're a great guy. You may be a great guy, but that doesn't solve my problem, which is, are you a great mechanic? Do you have a team of people who know how to fix things? That's hugely important. So throw some testimonials in there. Please don't think it's bragging. It's not bragging. It's social proof. Number four, I think I'm on number four. Um, call your own phone number and see what pops up. If you've got a message that says, um, hey, we're all out for the 4th of July weekend and it's March, guess what? What that tells me is you're not paying attention to details and I want to know if you're going to do the same thing to my vehicle. So pay attention to those little things. When I work with airline executives, I tell them, Call your, call your own customer help number. And they're like, what? And I'm like, no, we're going to do this right now. And I dial the number and it says, you know, your wait time is three hours and 42 minutes. And I'm like, see, you don't know this because you don't book your own airline flights. And they're horrified. So look at things from the perspective of the customer. And that's externally. That's your website. That's your, your LinkedIn profile. Make sure if you've got a business LinkedIn profile that that's up to date. Make sure that your LinkedIn profile, if they're talking about you, again, you might be a great neighbor. That's nice. But I want to know your skill set for what I need as a customer. My desires for my doctor, for example, I don't need a doctor for me with good bedside manner. If I need a neurosurgeon, I want the best neurosurgeon on the planet. I don't care if you're humble. Nobody ever woke up one day and said, oh, yes, I'd like a humble neurosurgeon. No, I want the best neurosurgeon on the planet. I don't care if you're arrogant. I don't care if you're an idiot. I don't care if you're mean. I don't care if you can't look people in the eye. If you're a great surgeon, that's what I care about. So in your recommendations on your LinkedIn profile, I want somebody else to tell me that you're great at what I need, which is fixing my car. And I'll say it, I'm a girl. I want to know you're not going to rip me off. Um, for some reason, there's a perception, and I'm not sure where it came from, but there's a perception that you're going to rip people off. Um, and I, I mean, I've got a, a fun story that I tell to my auto friends. Um, I brought a vehicle in to get an oil change. And they said, and this was on the East Coast, and they said, well, we can't do an oil change without doing diagnostics, which you and I both know is nonsense. And they called me later and said, um, you also need new tires. And I said, yeah, I'm going to come talk to you and we're going to need a manager. So I brought the manager out. I said, do you see these chalk marks on my tires? I said, they're brand new tires. Got them three days ago. So I don't trust anything your people are telling me. I don't trust anything about wow. any of the work you said you're going to do. And I don't know why that is. And I'm pretty sure it's not because I'm a girl, but there's a perception there that, that does exist. Um, I said, but I find you to be dishonest and I'm going to tell all of my friends, all of my friends, every single friend that I have, I'm going to shout it from the rooftops. I'm going to say it from stage that you're dishonest. So from that, that type of thing. So that's what we want. We want reliability with work and we want honesty when it comes time to fixing a problem. And, and, that, and when you think about it, it's pretty darn basic, but the perception, and it only takes a few people to ruin it. For example, there's probably a fast food restaurant that you've been to and you had kind of a really bad meal. And maybe it was a franchise. You've never been back to that franchise again because that one bad meal, you got sick, whatever it is, you're finished. You're never going back there again. It just takes one to cause that doubt. So what we've got to do in our shop is we've got to make sure every single one of our people is overcoming the baggage that our customers are coming in with. We've all had bad experiences. I want you to be the one that is going to override all of that. And once I find you as a customer, I'm not going anywhere else. And I will do the same thing. I will tell all of my friends about you. You got to go talk to Jay. You got to go. Jay's the guy. Jay's my guy. Right now, my service guy, his name is Paul. When Paul retires, I'm stuck. I'm like, Paul, what am I going to do? And you leave me. What's going to happen? Because uh, he's my guy. And once we find those people, um, we're more loyal to you than we are to our romantic partners. I mean, divorces happen, but I am not changing my service advisor. Just point that out. I think this comedy thing is going to work out for you uh, in the long run. Uh, I, I, it's funny because I do right off the top of my head when you're saying that I haven't eaten at a Burger King in 10 years because I had uh, a, a bad experience at one in Indiana, just driving through Indiana. And it, it's always stuck with me. And I think it's something visually in my head that just I can't get rid of. Right. Um, so 100% agree there. And then the other thing I was going to ask is, 
is there an appropriate way to ask for testimonials? Do you have any advice for how you go out and get those good testimonials? Absolutely. There are people like me who are effusive in our praise. And when I say, Jay, you all did such a great job on my vehicle. I just, I love the fact that I can trust you with every single thing I come in with. Um, and frankly, I don't know what's going to happen when you leave. That's the moment. You say, hey, Mary, can I, can you do me a favor? Eas easiest thing ever. You pull out your phone and you say, do you mind saying that on video? And I'm going to do it and I'm going to do it better. I'm going to go, hey, my name is Mary Kelly and I just had the best experience ever with Jay. And Jay's team took such good care of me with my, my vehicle. My vehicle was doing that thing where it makes that weird sound that we none of us know what that is. And when I took it in, I just knew that they would be able to take care of it. And, you know, they could have told me it was a $3,000 job and what it was, it was a loose screw. They fixed it, didn't even charge me. They took care of me. Now, you're going to get all that on tape. What you can use as a testimonial is, I trust Jay and his team to take care of me every time. I know they're never gonna overcharge me. I know that they're gonna do a great job. I know that they're gonna make sure I'm safe on the road. So from that, and then you, you can pick that out. And then you say, hey, Mary, can I use this as a testimonial on my website? Now, if I'm a testimonial on the website, so you're gonna say, Mary Kelly, author of the five minute leadership guide. Okay, first off, that's free PR for me. And I love that. But more importantly, I love you. So I want you to do well. And when you've got rabid fans like me, I mean, rabid, crazy fans, we love it when you do well and we are happy to help. So whenever somebody says, thank you, or I don't know what I'd do without you or whatever, those, those online surveys afterwards, that's not the time to get testimonials. The testimonial is a face-to-face -face interaction. Walk outside. Hey, Mrs. Jones, you know, um, how did everything go today? Oh, everything just went great. Well, what happened? You know, can you tell me about your your experience today. Oh my goodness. Well, I showed up and Jay was just so nice. He's always so nice. And he really helped me figure out this problem. And I was so worried. And it turns out it was a $98 fix and I just couldn't be happier. So what you're going to put is, I always come to Jay and I couldn't be happier with the service I receive. So you want that, that effusive praise at that moment of pain. So a very good friend of mine said, his why is the dentist who extracts payment while the tooth still hurts. So as soon as you've relieved that pain point, that's when you want that testimony. Bill. So it's not only just asking, it's the timing of when you ask. Absolutely. That's interesting. I, have you ever seen anybody that's gone too far in trying to gain trust? Uh, so when I, when I say that, I feel like there's certain situations where you can almost be awkward, like where you're trying to like overextend or try to like say if you're a customer walking in and I'm like, okay, in the back of my head, I know that maybe Mary had a bad experience or uh, that she's not overly trusting of a shop and I'm trying to, to gain that trust. Is it simply just doing your job and doing a good job at it? Or is it like, have you ever seen somebody that's tried too hard to gain trust? Um, stop talking when the sale's made. Like with my guy, Paul, he doesn't have to tell me stuff. I'm like, here you go. And he goes, do you want to do this? I'm like, I'm like, Paul, I just need the bare minimum because I'm going to make a thousand mile ride and I'm going to bring it back to the end of it. And that's when we're going to do the stuff. He's like, okay. He needs to stop talking then. He needs to be like, got it. We'll take care of you. Make sure you're safe for the next, you know, 2000 miles. That's it. But when somebody comes in and goes, I'm not sure what I need or this, that's when you say, so we pride ourselves on making sure that we are delivering the, the service that you want, doing the job you want, making sure we're not, you know, over servicing your vehicle. Um, and we're very mindful of the fact that you have a budget. And all of a sudden you're like, oh, okay. All right. That's what we care about. Um, we just, we want, we want our vehicles taken care of and we don't want to get ripped off. Um, and unfortunately there are people out there who do that and they give the rest of the industry a bad name. So yeah, you can, you can oversell yourself and you don't need to. Yeah. Stop. There, there's a time to over, yes. Um, if we weren't recording this, I would tell you that there's some funny dating metaphors, but we're not going to use those because this is a family show. <laughs> I do need to hear those, by the way. That, uh, that sounds amazing. So uh, as we're looking at trying to get more out of our businesses, um, and when I say that, with more with less, right? We're talking about how we make ourselves more productive is it as simple as putting processes in place and executing those processes? Or is there, I'm guessing there's a lot more to it in terms of, of really generating uh, the productivity that we desire. Sure. 
So I've got a new book coming out called Seconds Count because seconds do count. One of the best things the Naval Academy taught me was one minute is a long amount of time. And think about that. When somebody blows a tire on a highway, that first 10 seconds is an eternity. Seconds count. So when you think about your life, our life is a finite number of unknown minutes. We can't waste it on stuff that doesn't matter. So how do we make the most best, highest use of our time, which is also going to help our business? So I've got a couple of tools for your folks today. And All some right. of those um, we had talked about before. One is the productivity sheets. So I do one of these every single day in my life. Everybody listening to this gets access to all of this and it's free. In those productivity sheets, and I do them, like I said, every single day of my life, Christmas, 4th of July, Valentine's, every single day. And it's the calls I need to make, the appointments I have, the follow-up I need to do, and my actual to-dos of the day. And they're all in equal amounts. So for example, many people are not very good at sales calls. They're not very good at follow-up calls. Hey, Mrs. Jones, how is your vehicle servicing? Or, hey, this is Mike from the shop. You know, I just want to make sure everything worked out okay. You know, we repaired that tire, but I want to make sure it's still driving okay. Let us know if you want us to take another look at it. Okay. No, it seems to be going fine. Thanks so much. Nobody ever does that. Do you know how many vehicles are sold every single year and the salespeople never, ever call people afterwards? Wait, that was a $50,000 purchase and you can't be bothered with a phone call? What's wrong with you? Um, and I say this to car dealerships all the time. So make the phone calls, make the follow-up calls, even if you think there's a problem, especially if you think there's going to be a problem or, hey, you know, I just want to call because you brought your car in yesterday for, you know, loose muffler and it turned out, you know, um, there was actually a problem with your radiator and, you know, I just, I felt really badly that, you know, the, the fix wound up being a little bit more extensive than you thought. I wanted to make sure that everything's running okay. Just wanted to check, make sure everything's good for you today. Wait a second. Nobody ever does that. Um, and just a follow-up call. Number one, number two, the to-dos. What do you actually have to do today? What does your team have to do today? What jobs do you need to make sure happen today? And realizing that that changes every single morning when you show up to work. But what are your absolute to-dos with running your business? What do you have to do? And then what are your appointments for the day? Who's coming in? Who do you need to talk to? And yes, it is very, very easy to stay in your office and do the work that makes the business run. But you got to get out on the floor. You got to get out and walk around. And don't just walk around and ask your customers, how you doing? Because you're going to get three things. Good, great, fine. Good, great, fine. Your employees, good, great, fine. Doesn't tell you anything about what's actually going on in their head. So for both your employees and your customers, give them a range. Hey, Jay, on a scale of one to 10, how's everything going today? 10 is absolutely fantastic. One is, oh, pretty darn badly. I'm just lucky to be sitting here. How's everything going today? How are you with everything going on in the world? And if Jay says, you know, I'm an eight. Well, that's fantastic. Well, an eight, well, what's going to make you, what could get you up to a nine, maybe a 10? And Jay says, you know, I'm, I'm kind of thinking about planning, you know, planning a vacation and, and I'm thinking about moving. I'm thinking about this. Oh, okay, great. Now I'm not worried about Jay. But if Jay says, I'm a two, then I'm going to stop everything I am doing, everything, and, and say, Jay, hey, uh, you know, is there something you want to talk about? Is there something I can work through with you? Is there something, you know, I can, we can do to help? Now, this doesn't mean you have to solve all Jay's problems, but it does mean you have to show an interest in what's going on. And all of a sudden you realize that people, a lot of times are coming to work and they've got stuff going on that you don't know about. Everybody's got stuff. Um, even people whose lives look perfect, yeah, they got stuff. And our job as leaders is to make sure that we are providing help when people need it. Or if somebody says, you know, we, um, we just got evicted from our house last week and now the car doesn't run and I'm really, really worried and this, that, whatever. Hey, as a business manager, you kind of need to know that if you're part of fixing this person's world. So get up from your desk, walk around and make an effort to find out what's actually going on with both your customers and your people. I, I've got a great example of that because I think I, I love the range that you talk about because I, I do think that's critically important. Uh, I had a, a friend of mine who was running a business, had a, an employee that was traditionally really, really good, really productive, and then fell off a cliff, right? Uh, just not showing up to work on time, sloppy, things falling apart. You know, it just wasn't looking good it, to the point to where the manager was going to fire the individual. And I said, wait a minute, like, take a step back. Have you talked to them about what's going on? Like, there's got to be something more there. It's not just that they're, they all of a sudden lost all of their skills. Like, it's something else happened. And as they dug, they found out that he was going through a divorce and it was having a really, really, he was having a really hard time with it. Of course he is. And 
being able to sit down and just get it off his chest, his productivity shot right back up again. And it was the craziest thing because me standing back, you know, ways and just hearing the situation uh, kind of on the side, it was so obvious to me, but the manager that was in it every day didn't see that. And I think what you talk about when somebody does answer as a two, that should be an immediate red flag. And I love the way that you say that where stop everything, figure out what's going on. And there's got to be more than just what you're seeing. There's something else there. And we say all the time that our people are our most important asset. And in most businesses, they represent about 64% of the overall costs of the business. So it's our benefits, it's what we pay people, it's you know the healthcare, it's recruiting, it's retaining, it's training, it's all of that, 64% of our business. And yet most of my leaders, when I say, when was the last time you walked around and said, hey, Jay, I just want to let you know, you did such a great job on that really difficult truck. And I know it took a little bit of digging, but I really admire how you got to the actual problem and um, just took great care of our customers. Thanks for doing that. And my leaders say, well, I don't have time for that. I'm like, well, okay, that took a minute, one minute, maybe find out what's going on and then thank the people for doing specific actions. Don't just send an email at the end of the day. Hey, thanks everybody for a really good day. We made money. No, no, that is not why people show up every day. That is not why people get out of bed. That is not why people leave their families. That is not why people leave their dog. They show up every day because they want to make a difference and they want to feel important and they want to be respected, but they also want to be appreciated and valued for their contribution. And as leaders, we have to kind of, we have that fairy dust. We have to, you know, dust that fairy dust around and spread the happy fairy dust. And that doesn't mean it's all about rainbows and sprinkles and unicorns and, you know, ice cream. It, it means that we've got to genuinely appreciate the people who get up and make things happen. And that means thanking them for specific actions, recognizing specific actions, and making sure we're not pitting people against each other. That is so impactful because that is the number one thing we hear from technicians that work in shops is that they don't feel respected. They feel like they're a number. They, you know, they all they all they care about is the hours that I put out. They don't care about me as a person. And it is by far over and above pay, over and above everything, the number one thing that uh, that technicians have a problem with. Harvard Business Review came out and found that 58% of people would take a pay cut if it meant their immediate supervisor would be fired. So of course I'm an economist. So I was like, well, how much money? How much of a pay cut? And is that a one-time deal or over time? <laughs> But there's a problem because again, and that magic number is 58, 58% of managers have never received any managerial training. So it's not really a surprise that 60% of our managers are failing in the first two years because they're simply not being taught how to do that. A lot of times we take a great technician and we go, great, you're going to be in charge of this team of people in this part of the shop, or we're going to promote you into you know, a service advisor. We're going to promote you into this. And maybe that's not the skill set, or maybe they need some training along the way. And we've got, we've got to treat every single individual as exactly that individuals. Some people are going to figure it out. Other people are going to need help. Man, the impact behind that. I mean, that is so true to our industry. And I would be fascinated to see, I actually put a poll out uh, last week on LinkedIn that just asked, you know, if uh, service managers out there, where did you come from? You know, was technicians, service advisors, and uh, most of the majority, somewhere around 70, 75%, were either technicians or service writers before taking that service manager position and probably didn't get a lot of that management training up front. And, you know, I think when you look at leadership and when you put somebody in charge of a team, you're, you hit it on the head. It's a different skill set altogether. The technician versus the leader or the manager, you're looking at through two different lenses and it really changes what you do. It absolutely does. And leadership and management is something you have to work on every single day. To me, it's like going to the gym. If you don't go to the gym, it's not, you're not going to stay the same. You're going to get worse. And as leaders, a lot of leaders, they get to a certain level and they start coasting. And that to me is dangerous because they don't realize they're coasting downhill and they don't realize they're taking the team with them. One of the things we do at Wrenchway is help technicians find great places to work. If you think your shop is a top shop, we want to hear from you. Wrenchway Top Shop pages are like resumes for shops. They share all the details technicians want to know about before they apply, such as compensation ranges for all levels, photos and videos of the service area, 
videos of technicians and managers, and frequently asked questions on work environment, career development, and hiring process. Attract more technicians to your shop by becoming a Rentway Top Shop. Visit rentway.com to contact us and learn more. Link is in the show notes. So what type of training should somebody look for uh, in that regard? So say if it is a, a technician that's out there and they're aspiring to, to do more, is it on them to kind of just take on that additional responsibility of, hey, I need to start reading consistently or I need to look out for classes at the local university or, or tech school, whatever it might be. Uh, are there opportunities out there for them to, to get better in terms of their management style? There certainly is. Uh, and there's so many tools available. When I was a junior officer, I, I, um, I wanted more leadership and managerial training and the military is really good about doing that, but I still felt like I needed more. And so I was looking at, I was reading a book a week on leadership and management and I'm studying and I'm trying really hard and I'm staying up late and getting up early and I'm at the gym and I'm on the treadmill and I'm trying to read these books and all of this. And then I thought, well, wait a second, if I'm struggling with this, I wonder how many other people are as well. So for me personally, I started to make management checklists and leadership checklists and team building checklists. And if I got a good idea, I turned it into a checklist. Because if I if I get a good idea, I'm, I'm, I'm not guaranteed I'm going to get it again. So I have to write it down somewhere. And this is where the series, the five minute business success and accountability series came from. And I managed to put it all together way after I retired. There's about 80 of these five minute plans. So they're one page, just one page. And there's a page on leadership promotion, leadership improvement. You know, how are you doing as a leader? What are the people around you need from you? Things like that. But there's also very workable things like a five minute business plan, a five minute vision plan, a five minute how to, how to settle conflict at work plan, how to engage your employees better. Just these one page shots in the arm. So, okay, I can wake up every day. I don't have time to spend 40 hours in a management training program. I've got this problem today, or I think two of my folks are maybe kind of, they're thinking about duking it out at work. They haven't done it yet, but it's only a matter of time. And I need <laughs> to address that there. <laughs> right? So you grab the conflict management thing and you're like, okay, so what do I do? Got it. And then you get them together and go, okay. And you look at the cheat sheet and you go, this is what we're going to do right now. And and it walks you through that. So I'm a big fan of constantly trying to make yourself better, but also don't rely. I mean, I can't rely just on myself. I have to rely on all of the people who came before me. And I have to make sure that I'm capitalizing on all that brain power. So I I do, I I still do, I read, um, I still read a book a week. I still do book summaries. Um, so that's my cheat you know, thing. I do book summaries sometimes. Um, and then I'll do the book summary and then I'll go, oh, I really need to do the whole book. Or sometimes I go, okay, I think I got it. I'm not going to do the whole book. But I do that. And then I use these five minute plans. So for your audience, there, um, I, I think, you know, we talked about this productiveleaders.com forward slash free is the site where you can get just a handful, a good handful of some of those five minute plans. And the business plan is there, the vision plan is there, the productivity plan, how to be more productive at work with your limited amount of time is there. And it's just a tool that you can pull up and say, oh gosh, you know, maybe this would help today. And every single day, it's kind of like when you're running, you know, you're out running and you're doing a couple miles and you're thinking, okay, how do I be better, faster, stronger, better, faster, stronger? That's where we need to be in the business place too. Where are we going to be better, faster, stronger? How are we going to be better? And what does better look like? And so I think for our people, especially our first time managers, you know, what does better look like? And what does it look like to our employees? And what does it look like to our customers? When you show up and your shop is dirty, what does that, what does that say about your shop? And I'm not talking grease. We all get grease, but I'm talking trash. I'm talking old food. I'm talking stuff stuffed in corners. I'm talking dirty. And we've got shops that are like that. Um, and sometimes people say, well, nobody cares. It's a shop. Well, people do care. If that's what they see, that's what they care. And if your employees look around and you're setting the example and you're the messiest one there. And look, I'm the first one to say, I hire professional organizers to do my office because um, it's it's not a natural skill for me. So I know I have to struggle with this. This is why I have great respect and, and deep empathy for people who also struggle. But what does it say to your employees when you're the one who's leaving the tools out, when you're the one who's not cleaning the stuff? What does it say? Um, and there's this element of don't care. 
And, you know, I, there's, we've all seen it where a very senior person will walk by a piece of trash on the ground and they go, well, somebody else's job. Well, wait a second. What does that tell everybody else? Really, you can't pick up a piece of trash. What does that look like? Um, it's our responsibility. And part of, I think, our job is to make every single person, every single person as part of our shop feel as though they are the owners and they act that way. Um, and that's one of the things that I would really like to see more of, and not just in the shop business, but in a lot of businesses, I want more employees to think like owners. How do you do that? How do you, how do you cater that? Like, how do you grow that? Yeah, that's a tough one. And it's <laughs> tough because again, people act in their own best self-interest. And if they don't feel like there's anything in it for them, they sometimes wonder, well, why should I bother? And the reason they should bother is because it matters and because people notice. And the best compliment, I, I was uh, doing some work for a, another company in California very recently, and um, there was about a number seven person on the totem pole. And I went to the boss, I said, you got to watch out for that person. And they go, what do you mean? I said, that person thinks like an owner. I said, they have your best interest, they've got your back, and you don't even realize it. I said, but that person thinks like an owner. And those are the people you want as a shop. You want to bring them in as a partner. You want to bring them in. You want to elevate them. Um, and they don't have necessarily, I mean, they may stay as a technician, but they could still be a partner in the shop. And this leads you into what happens when you no longer want to be running that shop. What is your succession plan? And that's where you, I mean, you, and you have to throw it out to your people. Hey, I'm not going to be around forever. Um, none of us are. And what is the shop going to look like in 20 years? Because I'm not going to be here. Somebody else is going to be running that shop. Is it going to be you? And some people go, you know what? It's never going to be me. I don't want any part of it. I'm just happy doing what I do every day. And other people say, not only do I want your shop, I want 10 more just like you. And that's that's great. That's exciting to me. I, I love those types of conversations. I think they're it's so fun when you see a, a young person that has those aspirations and, and wants to be uh, great and really that ownership mentality. Uh, talk to me a little bit about the hiring process there then. Uh, is there a way when you're interviewing somebody to really pick out those skills? Because I think for everybody, you you want you want people to, to act like owners, right? You want people to really be vested in your company. Uh, when you're looking to, to pick out people to come work for you, especially in this day and age where it, there's a, a huge shortage of workers in every industry, it feels like right now, uh, how do you how do you pick those people out? I mean, are there traits that you look for? Is it questions that you ask to really kind of uh, pull that out of them, or is it more gut feel of hey, this person's really going to be loyal? Such a great question. Again, so a few things. Many people are you watch the news and you're so panicked when you hear that we have four million job openings that we're unable to fill, and so people are reluctant to fire bad people because you're thinking, oh, I'm never gonna be able to hire somebody else, or there's no, I mean, the perception is there's nobody out there. That's not really true. 23 million people have voluntarily left their jobs in the past 12 months, and mostly because they're fed up with their first line supervisors. So a couple of things you can do. First, when you are looking for testimonials about your, your job, get your employees to do a, a testimonial. Um, I One of the things I love to do in a shop is I will walk around with my iPhone, um, or Android or whatever, and a little microphone. And I'm like, hey, Jay, um, I'm gonna clip this microphone on you and I'm gonna hold this camera. Jay, um, what do you love about your job? And Jay's like, wait, love about my job? Guess what? There's a lot of people out there who love what they do. And those are the people you want on camera and you're gonna clip those videos and you're gonna put them on your website. Um, you know, my name is Jay and I love getting, every, getting up every day and fixing other people's problems. You know, people come to us when they don't know what's wrong necessarily, or sometimes they do, but they need us to fix the most, the most important thing in their life of, for reliability, and that's their vehicle. And I get to put people back on the road, boom. Or I love the fact that I get to work with my hands every single day. I've always been that kind of person, you know, as a five-year-old child, I was taking apart toasters, and now I get to take apart cars, and that's way more fun. And, you know, that. Or I love doing the accounting for this type of work because I love the people who show up every day and fix things. I love our customers who show up every day and trust us with their vehicles. And I love making sure that we are running a great business, you know? So whatever part of the organization, so from your marketing to your accounting, to your, your techs, 
have testimonials, video testimonials on your website. And then when people Google and they go, you know what, I'm not really sure what I want to do. Maybe I could go do that. All of a sudden your website pops up. You're going to have the right keywords. It's going to be YouTube. It's going to be SEO. It's going to be all those things. So that's one thing you can do is make sure you're attracting the right people. You don't want to promise people, you know, the sunshine, roses, and unicorns when it's actual work. Um, you don't want you don't want to sell people a bill of goods. This is why people ghost their brand new employers. They show up and by noon, they're disgusted. It wasn't anything close to what they thought and they're out of there. The other thing we do when we hire people is we do the dreaded onboarding process and we, we throw them through two weeks of dismally bad onboarding taught by people who are terrible instructors in the worst possible places and make it as boring as possible. And so we've taken a highly motivated person and in just two weeks, we have relegated them to somebody who's just shown up with a paycheck. And that's awful. So most of our onboarding processes need to change. The third thing is in the actual hiring. Try to get a sense of people who want to show up and do a good job every day. Now, it doesn't mean that they, they need experience in this. Maybe they have, maybe they haven't. Maybe you've got a training program. Maybe you've got an apprenticeship program. Whatever you've got, I, I will tell you that I would rather have fewer people and better people than more people who are not. Um, I would hire for attitude over skill almost any day. Um, it's, you, it's hard to fix a bad attitude. You can teach a skill. You can teach a willing person a skill. Um, bad attitude is hard to weed out and it spreads. So I want people who are going to show up every day and, and get to it and be happy about it and go home proud at the end of every day. And partly we got to train people. Many people have never been trained. They don't know how to work. They don't know what it means to work an eight hour day or a 10 hour day or a six hour day, whatever you got. They just don't know. And so we have to train them. It is all about the training process. And sometimes people think, well, you know, Jay came over from that other shop and Jay's 42 years old and Jay should know. Well, Jay should know, but that doesn't mean Jay does know. Does. So we have to say, okay, what are you comfortable doing? So um, let's, let's see what you got and, you know, do a test. Hey, you know, how would you approach this problem or what would you do here? And get, if you're going to ask people to do hands-on work, give them a hands-on interview really speak to their skill set instead of, you know, instead of those tired questions, well, tell me a time in your childhood where you overcame something difficult. Who cares? You know, I don't it, really, that's what you're thinking about. No. So what do you like to work best on a car? Have you ever done this before? No, but I'd like to learn. Okay. How would you approach this problem? Do you know which way a wrench turns? Okay. We can teach you. I, you know, whatever skill set people have, have them show you that in the interview. I, I love everything you just said there. And, it, you know, it's something we preach a lot from the Wrenchway side and getting those testimonials. And and we talk a lot about the training and the hiring for good attitude. And it, it, it's just so important. And, you know, tying that into how you produce more with less, people are foundational to all of that. Like if, if you don't have good people that really care it's you can put all the process and you can do anything and if you don't have anybody executing it you're not going anywhere right that's true it's totally true and our people really are everything and sometimes we forget that 100 percent right yes i it drives me crazy because that that is something where I, and i get it right because it, there's a lot of business owners or managers that get stuck in the weeds and they get stuck in the day-to-day -day and putting out fires and and it almost i think there's some personalities that might do it better than others in terms of uh giving that attaboy or walking out in you know that management by walking around philosophy where you're, you're going out and actually talking to people but um you know generating good conversations understanding where your team's at and Going back to the hiring process, I mean, you have me so pumped up here because I, 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 I think it's so spot on, but getting those good people in the door, uh, it just, it's so, so vitally important. And when you're desperate and you're just trying to make a hire just to fill a spot, I, I've seen it over and over and over again. It doesn't work out well most times. And it, it, it is because you hire somebody that might have the technical aptitude, but just completely missing the attitude portion. And it, it, it has such a negative impact on a business when you get that bad attitude in and it starts to wear on other people. And then you start to lose good people because they don't want to put up with that negative person. I mean, it's just, it, it everything you touched on was absolutely spot on. Um, 
I also love the idea that the different parts of our shop have to work together. And, and a lot of times our, the owners don't make the pieces work together. They silo different aspects. And as a result, our team members don't know how to work well together. Or they say, oh, well, they're, they're over in marketing. We don't really talk to them. Or they're in accounting. We don't really talk to them. Or they, they're an admin. We don't talk to them. Well, wait a second. If the whole team is not working together as a team, you probably have a problem somewhere. And the problem is probably you. Um, and I say that with all love. And that is... You know, you're so busy, head down, making things work every day that you're not going, hey, you know, Ralph, when was the last time, you know, you talked to Roger? And they're like, um, I think the Christmas party, we, we maybe said hi to each other. And it's so easy for us to get into that place. And we've all done it. That's why I know people do it, because I did it. You know, you get in every day and you, you do your thing and then you leave and you're exhausted at the end of the day and, and you go, oh, I just didn't have time. Well, wait a second. You got to take time. You got to just make the time to do it. Uh, Work expands to fill the time you have, which is why I love to have, again, you know, the checklist that you do every single day. And then the other tool that your folks are, um, that I reference for your folks is that 12 month business success and accountability yes. plan. And I love that as a tool. I coil bind that for a lot of my customers. I will white label it and put their company on the front of it. And you can start at any time in the year. It's just 12 months and it's a downloadable thing. And you as the owner, you as the, the manager, you put down your top five goals for the month. And then you write down the things that you want to do more of. Oh, I'd like to do more of, you know, talking to me people. If you're only doing your performance evaluations once a year, that's a terrible idea. First off, nobody likes them. It doesn't accomplish anything. You're much better off with more frequent informal, casual conversations than you are once a year. Well, Jay, we've decided to talk to you about your performance this year. Nobody likes it. Everybody hates it. It doesn't accomplish anything. It's painful. Um, it's painful on all sides. And whoever came up with that, oh, one of the worst things ever happened in corporate America. Um, what do you want to do more of? What do you want to do less of? What, you know, I want, when I, one of the things I ask my, my business owners is, what do you know about your people? Do you, do you know what kind of cars they drive? Do you know what kind of cars their family members drive? Um, do you know how many kids they have? Do you know what kind of dogs they have? You know, what is important to them? And those are the kinds of questions that I want my business owners to do more of. I also want them to do less of things. I, I call it the don't matter list. If you can outsource it, it doesn't matter. So if you're going to make a flyer, it, it's nice for you to prove it, but it doesn't matter. Somebody else can do that job for you. If if there's things that other people can do, like your service advisor can make those phone calls, then great, they can do that. And maybe they want to bring you in on some of the more important phone calls. That's great. What do you want to do more of? What do you want to do less of? What do you need to resolve in the workplace? You know, what three people, and I challenge all my business owners with this, what three people can you call every single month to ask for advice? And they go, what? Well, who are you learning from? And this is why I love what you're doing because you've got this huge group of people where if you said, hey, everybody pick up the phone and call somebody else and just say, hey, I just love to ask you a question. I just five minutes. I promise no more than five minutes. Two things happen. First off, you're strengthening the network. You're strengthening the relationship and you might be learning something in the process. So I, that's my challenge. Um, every month, and I say three a month, not four, because then it makes it like one a week and that seems hard, but three a month seems very doable. And then three phone calls a month that's not a sales call to your clients, your decision makers, your suppliers, just to check in and let them know, hey, you know, we're a shop of humans. Um, we're, we like doing people doing business with humans and we like doing business with people we believe, like, and trust. And you're that person. And thanks very much. Like, that's it. And then grade the month. Every month, how was this month? Do we meet our goals? Do we meet our quotas? Are we making uh, the right revenue? Did we did we make any advancements with either training our people or hiring the right people or firing the, the wrong people? And firing the wrong person is just as important as hiring the right people. And then what did we learn this month? And it's just two pages every month that allows you to track that. Now, wouldn't it be cool if you, as the shop manager or owner, you had your goals and your people actually knew what your goals were? Crazy idea. If they knew what you were thinking that month. I worked with a, a landscaping CEO and every month he brought every single person. I'm talking the guy who pushed lawnmowers and he said, here's our numbers for the month. Every single month, he brought everybody in and showed them everything. This is what we spent on marketing. This is what we spent on advertising. This is what we spend per hour. This is what you make per hour. This is what we charge per hour. I mean, mapped it out for everybody. No secrets. And people got away from the idea of, well, they're charging $80 an hour and I'm only getting paid $32. They, all of a sudden, they realized where that other money went 
And it made all the difference in people thinking again, what we go back to thinking like an owner. So this 12 month business success and accountability plan is, um, it's a game changer when you just use it for, just try it for three months and see what happens. And if it doesn't make a difference, I'll refund you every penny that I'm giving it to you for free. <laughs> I, I Even that side of breaking it down for, uh, for somebody is, uh, you're getting the buy-in that you're getting understanding, right? Like I think there's so many technicians in our world that just don't have understanding of the business and and only look at the difference between posted labor rate and what they're getting paid and don't know everything that goes in between it. Uh, it just incredibly good advice. Now, how and we're getting close to our time here, but I am curious as to the importance of vision and being able to get what you see as a manager uh, in, in painting that vision to your team, like what is the impact that vision has and how, how can you help guide that or, or paint that picture for, uh, for your team? So the mission is what we do. We fix vehicles. The vision is where we're going. We are the shop everyone's mom wants to come to. It's different. It's a totally different vibe. It's a totally different place. The vision is where we're going. We are the shop that you would tell your mom to go to because you know we're going to take great care of her. You know that everything is going to be fantastic. She's going to be treated with dignity and respect, and so is her vehicle. And, and we are that. So the vision is where we're going. So we want to look at who we're serving right now. Who are Who's the bulk of our customers? Who do we want to serve? And partly, are we currently serving the people we want to serve in the future? And sometimes the answer is no. Sometimes we want to elevate certain things or we want to go after a certain market. One of the places, I, I just did a, a, an auto conference and I told them, I said, if you really want business, there's a, there's a market. If you go after the boomers, you say, you know, we specialize in taking care of your mom's vehicle. We're going to show, we're going to show up at their place of their home, wherever they live or whatever, um, think that they might be retired and we're going to, we can do diagnostics on site. We're going to take care of them. We're going to, we're going to take it back to our shop and we're going to deliver it back to them um, because maybe they just came out of the hospital. Maybe they're a little bit infirm. Maybe they haven't driven that car in a couple of years, but they don't want to get rid of it. We all know that's the case, but we're going to be those people. You know, that's a whole market that I don't think anybody's touching. We serve people who are living in independent living facilities. Nobody's doing that. So things like that. Think about where you want to be focused and where you want to specialize and who you want to serve in the future. And what other changes are happening in the automotive world that's going to impact what it is we do differently in the future? Are we prepared to service electric vehicles? Do we want to service electric vehicles? Um, do, we, do we want any part of that? What else do we want to change? What's going to shift about how we operate moving into the future? And that's where you want to base your vision from. So your vision is looks is very forward looking. It's a little bit scary, and it should be so compelling and so exciting that people go, "Yeah, we're the shop that you take your that your mom goes to. We're the shop that you trust with your mom, or whatever that is, um, or we're the shop that does this." Um, you know, we love race cars and people who they thought they wanted a project car, but they don't really want a project car. They want a project car that's already running. That's, you know, we are the home of your project car that's not your garage. Or, um, you know, your, your tagline is, we get the project car out of your garage and into ours. And all of a sudden, everybody who's been sitting there frustrated because your partner's got a project car that's been sitting there for five years, they're like, hallelujah, I want to hire those people. So that's what I'm talking about. That vision is where you're going and what you're going to do in the future to not just fix cars, but delight people, get people excited about what you do because you do it so well and with the right spirit at the right time to the right person every time. And that has so much power in driving people, right? Even the people that work for you, the customers, everybody i mean when you have that, it, that there's just it's a different feeling when you wake up in the morning and i think that's what so many businesses miss out on you've really captured that really well and articulated that really well so i appreciate that we're about uh, up on our time i want uh, to give you a plug and uh, really be able to i think you've got some free resources for our listeners as well as i want uh, you to give uh, a way for people to get in touch with you because I, I, I've i listened to you speak 
it's so motivating. It's so uh, uh, captivating that I, I think anybody would be crazy not to have you come speak to their audience. Well, thank you so much. It's always an honor for me. And I just love the industry, as you can tell. So my free resources for your audience at ProductiveLeaders.com forward slash 2022 success. That has the in, that has the whole thing that most of my customers wind up paying for. So you're getting the super secret vault on that. So 2022 success. And then the stuff that lives all the time under the free section on my website, it's just productiveleaders.com forward slash free. So there are amazing resources there for your folks and they're welcome to go grab them. And I want them to all be wildly successful, wildly productive and wildly prosperous. So, and it's Mary Kelly, if they want me specifically, it's Mary at productiveleaders.com. I answer all my own emails and I would love to connect. Amazing podcast. It is such a pleasure to, to get to sit down and talk with you and pick your brain for an hour. Uh, I, I can't thank you enough for, for taking the time out of your crazy schedule uh, to join us and, and hope we can do it again sometime. Can't wait, Jay. Thank you so much. See you soon.